and get busy with it. I was uh, telling uh, Jim and, and Jeremy before the lesson, I, uh, I fear that I might not complete the book next week. I had planned to, I want to, but there's just so much material in chapters two and three, it's going to be hard to get through it all. So we'll see. I'll keep my eye on the clock and um, uh, I might have to cut it short tonight if we don't get through all the material at the end with the five woes, but um, there's plenty to talk about. So we'll start it in Habakkuk chapter two. Now, if you call the outline of Habakkuk, it's pretty simple. Three chapters. Uh, the first one is about Habakkuk's burden, uh, his questions to the Lord about uh, when and how long is, is he going to wait before he comes back to avenge uh, the, the, the righteous in Israel and, and bring judgment to the sinners and the wicked that abound in Israel at this time, uh, as well as the nations around. So he's saying, how long? Uh, God responds, of course, with, well, I'm raising up the Chaldeans as I speak. And then he says, they're going to come and slaughter them all. And then Habakkuk says, wow, God, you're very holy and pure, but those Chaldeans are worse than the Israelites. So is that a righteous thing or not that you're going to be raising them? He raises the question down in verse uh, oh, 14. He says, thou art pure eyes than to be, or yeah, verse 13, thou art pure eyes than to behold evil and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore, why lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devours the man that is more righteous than he. Remember God's answer was on raising the Chaldeans. These are pagans, Gentiles, right? Uh, to be his rod of punishment to Israel. And, he, and the question that Habakkuk raises is, uh, is it not unjust? And so the, the questions Habakkuk raises in this book are the same questions people ask today, is why doesn't God intervene to stop evil, number one? And when d God does intervene, they complain about the way he does it. <laughs> uh, it's the same thing people continually do. Habakkuk, of course, is taking the position of a man of faith in these questions. Um, so it's not bad to ask those questions, but your, your heart should always be one in knowing, as Habakkuk does, that God is the Holy One. He's not unjust. So Habakkuk's raising the question, and he, he's expecting an answer. In Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1, he says, I will stand upon my watch and set, uh, the, uh, set me upon the tower, and will watch to see what he, God, will say unto me, and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And so he responds to God, and God's going to respond back to him, thus the conversation in the book. Now, in verse 1 here, when he says, I will stand upon my watch, um, <laughs> he, he's talking here about his, um, his responsibility and obligation to wait in the Lord and expecting that to occur, right? He's going to respond and answer him. Um, the watch has to do with uh, the night nighttime divided into watches. You've heard that in the scripture before, perhaps, that the night is divided into watches so uh, that the, the people in the city or in the town can be protected from uh, enemies. Uh, there will be guards set on watch on the towers. And thus, you find all over prophecy, the watchmen, the watchmen on the wall of the city and things like this. Um, some ministries named after that. But uh, you also find that the night is divided into certain watches or, or periods in which they would, they would uh, guard. Uh, in the Old Testament, you find there's uh, three watches in the night. In the New Testament, Jesus talks about four watches in the night and uh, how he even talks about in his ministry when he will return during these watches in the night and which watch it is and dispensationally what's going on. So it's fascinating to study that. Um, this is one of the things that we will skip for right now because it's not really the topic, but uh, you can study the watches of the night and find out uh, in Jesus' ministry uh, when things are going to happen in the future in prophecy, okay, depending on what watch the night is. And so all of this has to do with Israel's history, uh, waiting for the rising sun, S-U-N, to come in their kingdom. Malachi talks about that. And so before the sun rises in the morning, you have the night, right? And so as it gets closer to the time of God's fulfillment of his promises and the kingdom come, they're living through a night, which fits prophetically or dispensationally with what's going on. Israel was blessed by God um, and bore, birthed of God as, as a, a child nation. And then as they grew up and matured, they became more and more wicked. And thus it became nighttime and they were then living during this time of night and darkness until the sun rises. That's Jesus Christ and he returns and the kingdom comes. So um, this time in Habakkuk's life is a dark time, okay? Morally, spiritually, dispensationally. It's going to be a night time until the Lord returns. Um, and that's not when the Lord is born in the manger. That's when the Lord comes back in the kingdom. 
And so when Jesus uh, is born in the major, does uh, come to, to earth, to Israel, he comes during a time of the night. And then he says this, that, you know, I'm coming in a time of the night, I'm going to go away, you know, and you need to watch in the night. You know, that's why he, it says in prophecy, he will come as a thief in the night, right? Uh, there's a twofold understanding there. One is thieves come in the night and it's, it's somewhat of a, uh, of a shock and a surprise, but not only that, really the, the key to that phrase is that when thieves come in the night, they come to destroy, they come to take, right, unexpectedly. And this is what the Lord will do when he returns. He's the thief in the night. He's going to return and destroy and then bring that coming kingdom. So anyway, you can do that study for yourself. There's way too many verses to cover that tonight. And seeing that's not the subject, I just wanted to mention that parenthetically. He says, I will stand upon my watch, referring to the watchman on the wall, and set me upon the tower, and will watch to see what he, what God, the Lord, will say unto me. And so he's waiting, okay? And he's expecting something here. You see in the end of the verse, he says, I, I will uh, watch to see what he will say unto me, and what I shall answer when I am reproved. Okay? Now this is fascinating, because uh, he's expecting reproof. Yeah, a reproof is, uh, Habakkuk, you got it wrong. Yeah, that's what that means. And he knows he's got it wrong because his question implied God was unrighteous. And he knows God's not righteous. And so in his, his human brain and ours as well, we're going, that doesn't seem to make sense, God. I know you're righteous, but what you're doing doesn't seem like you are. And see, now we have a dilemma in ourselves. We're either going to trust God and say, I must be wrong. Or we're going to say, you know what? My judgment is right and God is unrighteous. Right? And this is the same choice people have today. You can come to the scripture and say, that doesn't sound right, and then say, well, I'm going to trust God that he's righteous and I am not. I must have it wrong. I'm feeble-minded. I need to learn something. I need corrected. Tell me where I'm wrong. Right? Or in our pride and arrogance, we can say, you know what? God's old-fashioned. It was written by men, this book. He's wrong. I got judgment right. My logic is flawless. You know, we can say that, and that's the wrong approach. So that's what that's Habakkuk is in the position here of saying, I'm waiting for a reproof. I'm waiting for it to come. I know I'm wrong. I want to know what, how I'm wrong. Proverbs, in all over the book of Proverbs, it talks about the righteous and how they expect reproof. Knowing, of course, Proverbs written to people under the law, but a lot of spiritual application we can take from Proverbs about um, what is good and what is bad, and what is, what is a right and wrong as far as a God's character. Uh, and in Proverbs 15, 31, the ear that hears the reproof of life abides among the wise. So you want to have wisdom, seek reproof. That's kind of contrary. You think the wise man would not need to be reproved because he's wise. Actually, the Bible says to become wise, you must be reproved. Because no one's born that way, you see. We're born wrong. And so you need to get the wrong out of you, Right? That's the teaching. And so if you can seek reproof to get the wrong out so you can be right, that's how you grow in wisdom. And so when you get to the point where you think that you don't need reproof, that reproof is bad, that when someone reproves you, you get offended, that's where you're going in the wrong direction. Right? Verse 15, uh, 32 says, He that refuseth instruction despises his own soul, but he that hears reproof getteth understanding. How do you get understanding? Show me where I'm wrong. That's how you get it. Right? And you don't say that mockingly, you say that realistically. Show me where I'm wrong, because I know that I'm wrong somewhere. I want to, to know righteous, and I want to understand things. Show me where I'm wrong. Okay? That's a good way to learn. Find someone that knows something uh, that you don't, and ask them, show me where I'm wrong. People love to teach, and that's how you grow in wisdom. Okay? Um, Romans 3, 4, let God be true and every man a liar. Uh, Paul actually quotes the Old Testament when he quotes that verse, let God be true and every man a liar. The every man includes... The per, you includes everyone, includes Habakkuk, right? And so he's expecting your proof, which means he is wise. Okay. Now Habakkuk 2, verse 2, the Lord answers. So his expectation of God's answer was right. Uh, God heard his cry, and he responds to him and says, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. So the second chapter begins the section of Habakkuk about the vision. And in the final chapter, in chapter 3, it's uh, Habakkuk's prayer after hearing the vision. Okay, so you have his cry and questions to God in chapter 1, God's uh, answer, his vision in chapter 2, and then Habakkuk's prayer, the change of his heart in chapter 3. Okay, so verse 2, the Lord answers. He says, write the vision, make it plain upon the tables. Now, it's interesting here, just as a matter of 
of hearing about how God communicates. When it says write the vision, God uses written words, right? We have a book that's written down. Uh, when God inspired scripture, inspiration means the written words of God. He wrote it down. Revelation is God speaking to someone. Like when he re revealed things to the prophets or revealed things to Paul, he spoke to him, right? But th when, when they wrote things down by inspiration, that's what that is. It's written word, okay? He says, write the vision and make it plain upon tables. So the plainness there of God's speech is something that in theological circles they call perspicuity, perspicableness. <laughs> I sound like Daffy Duck or something. Uh, <laughs> this word, uh, per perspicuity, it's even hard to say, has, has to do with being plain, being clear. The word itself isn't very clear, uh, but it means to be clear. It means that when God wrote the Bible, the Bible, uh, uh, the doctrine of perspicuity means that the Bible can be understood by you. The Bible is not some mystical book that cannot be understood by people, right? This is why I would always encourage you to believe the Bible because you can understand it. It may take some study, some time, some uh, collective study in conversations with uh, like-minded believers, but you can understand it, okay? It's not something that's hidden from humanity, all right? So you individually may need to grow, but God hasn't written this book too high for man to understand. He wrote it for us to understand it for that purpose. You say, well, yeah, that sh should be obvious, but it's really not. There are scholars and people who don't believe the Bible is inspired by God who think that if it were inspired by God, it's something that we cannot understand. And there's no way we can understand it, right? And so you've heard of the phrase, God works in mysterious ways, right? Nowhere found in the scripture, okay? God has kept secrets and mysteries, but he's revealed, and what he's revealed has been able to be understood, right? So I thought that was an interesting thing to see that in that verse there. He says, write the vision and make it plain, right? God never says uh, to, to write these instructions uh, so that they may not hear. Well, actually, he does, <laughs> right? But he does that in times of punishment, right? To those that believe, he gives them to understanding. Remember Jesus' ministry? He spoke in parables to the unbelievers and to the believers he explained. Right? Trust God in his words and you'll be able to understand his words. You have to come to him by faith and it's faith that, that actually begets more hearing. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. You have faith and your faith gets strengthened so that you can hear more of the word of God. You see, that's how it works. Meanwhile, uh, getting back to the, the text here. He says, write the vision, make it plain upon tables. Now, tables here aren't like eating tables, yet at the same time, um, it's something flat, right? Like a table. Um, and you're going to write something on these tables so that people can see it, which is exactly how you would make a sign, right? Take a flat table, saw the legs off, write something on it, put it on the side of your building. That's a sign, right? That's what he's saying here. So he says, write the vision, make it plain upon tables or tablets, right? that he may run that readeth it. Now that phrase there causes some confusion among the commentaries, and I would not bog down too much in it. Um, the, the differences in interpretation have to do with why this guy's running. And so we're kind of getting off topic talking about that. But I need to address it because people want to focus on the distractions a lot. Okay? What God is saying is write this vision down so people can read it, right? That's what he's saying. That's really the takeaway from verse 2. Well, the question is, why is this guy running? People think, well, he needs to write it so big so if someone's running by, like he's got to get to work or something like that, he can go, whoa, look at that. Because, you know, when you're driving past a sign at 60 miles an hour, if it's too small, you can't read it. So if it's a big sign, and zoom, there you go. You see the golden arches, right? So that's one interpretation. So he that runs by can actually read it, right? Okay. He is saying make it plain, <laughs> all right? Make it plain. Um, there's another interpretation that says, no, it's talking about uh, here's the vision and write it so that other people can take this message and run with it. Right? So I got the message. Now I'm going to run and tell someone else. This is, this is scholarship, folks. These are people with PhDs. This is what they say. Uh, and then uh, there's one that I read immediately when I saw it, but I, I, there's no scholar I've found that agrees with me, but uh, it doesn't matter one way or the other, um, that he may run that readeth. If you read what God is telling him later, it's a very scary thing. If you read something that fearful, sorry, I'm going to run. Uh, Revelation, they run to the caves, right? And so there's that, that's, that's Justin's interpretation there. Uh, does it matter what, why he's running? No, it doesn't. God said, write it, make it plain, right? And he's going to write the plain thing later, okay? 
So anyway, I thought I'd bring that up. Um, what is interesting, he says, write it plain on tables, uh, like these signs. And so the message is written on signs. And these signs in verse 4, or verse 3 rather, is for an appointed time. The vision is for an appointed time, right? So we have here, as I try to introduce the concept of prophecy, signs of the time. Okay? Now that phrase, signs of the times, does not exist anywhere in your Bible. This is something Christians have created. Now, that doesn't mean the idea is not there. The idea is there. But that phrase, a lot of Christian phrases that simply don't exist, kind of like the bride of Christ, is a phrase that does not exist in your Bible, right? Or he that spareth the rod spoileth the child. That's not the proverb exactly. The meaning is still kind of there, right, with the rod and the child and the discipline. But that phrase has been paraphrased by Christians, okay? And so um, I just bring that up to your attention. But you have here literally, God says, write these, a vision on tables, on these signs, so people can see, right? And then he says, for the vision is for an appointed time. That is literally a sign of an appointed time, right? So that when they see the sign and read it, they'll know what will happen in an appointed time. Okay, that's the idea of signs of the times. And what we'll read in this chapter and next are prophecies about what will happen to Nebuchadnezzar and ba the Babylonian Empire, but also, secondarily, distant in the future, what's going to happen for God to come back in judgment to the world and establish his kingdom and promises to Israel. Okay? And so we'll see there's prophecies here talking about the Chaldeans, which God's raising up, and Habakkuk is questioning their righteousness. And he goes, don't worry, I see that. They're going to be punished. Right? And he explains this. But in explaining this, he's also talking about in the future, because it's not just the Babylonians that we can ask this question about, right? I mean, what about the Republicans and the Democrats? I mean, what about, what about the Russians? What about, you know, the, the, wherever they are? There's wickedness all over the world, right? And God says, I see this. I'm not blind to it. And he has given a revelation in the Bible about how things will end on this earth, right? The book of Revelation. And so we see connections in Habakkuk 2 to revelation regarding God's end time for the planet and his promises to Israel. Okay. Anyway, that's, that's my setting the stage for it. So in verse three, it says the vision that he's giving here is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. It'll come true. Right. And though it tarry, wait for it because it will surely come. It will not tarry. So the surely is the emphasis there. It will surely come. It will not never come. Right. And so God appoints times and seasons. We find this throughout the scripture. Uh, something you ought to be aware of, that things aren't happening not according to what God knows will happen. Right? There are times appointed. When God does things, he does them according to times he's appointed. In Acts 17, in verse 26, for example, we found in, in our study of the middle chapters of the book of Acts that uh, Paul is preaching to uh, the Athenians here. And he says that God, who's not worshipped with men's hands, by the way, hath made of one blood all nations of men. There's no such thing as different uh, uh, evolutionary races. There's one blood of men. Every man, red, yellow, black, or white, as the children's song go, uh, is all of one blood uh, in the, of all nations to dwell on the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. And so, talking about the times there, you see how he says, he hath determined the times before appointed? Okay, there's been times appointed. You say, what are those? Is God a Calvinist? <laughs> no, that's a silly question. Uh, but uh, it's, it has nothing to do with him dictating ev every event that will happen, every thought that you have. It has to do with the times of certain things occurring. He's the one that says it'll happen, right? When does the Lord come? God appoints it, Right? When did the flood come? God appointed it. Right? When was the law delivered? God appointed the time. When did he deliver Israel out of Egypt? God set that time, right? And it wasn't just God sitting around fiddling his fingers saying, yep, I'm getting kind of tired up here in heaven. I think I'll do something. God appointed times. He had a plan and a purpose, right? And you go back and retrospect and look back at what God has done at times, and you see the times are there for a purpose. Right. But when you're stuck in the middle of it, it looks like God's slack or God's waiting too long or God's behind or, or something like this. And it's really not. OK, so whenever the Bible talks about God's appointed times, it has to do with our impatience in our he's trying to exhibit our, our, or try to teach us to trust God because God has times appointed. He's going to he's going to keep his time. OK. 
And so Acts 17, 26 talks about that. Galatians 4, 2, Paul mentions Jesus coming uh, and born of a woman under the law. Remember that? In Galatians 4, 2. And it says there's a time before appointed. He says that the heir, as long as he's a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. And he's speaking here, not only metaphorically about children and heirs um, and maturity of children into full grown adults, but also when God sent forth his son, made of a woman made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of the sons at an appointed time. Verse 4 says, when the fullness of time has, was come. God sent forth his son, right? So it wasn't out of the blue that Jesus was born 2,000 years ago, right? It was at the right time. And that time you can read about in prophecy. It was actually revealed that time, okay? So his first coming was revealed. His, the time of his second coming has not been yet. So uh, you have that. Uh, in Romans 5, verse 6, in Paul's epistles, he talks about God appointing times. It, it, not only in Galatians 4, but in Romans It's, it's good to have the knowledge of these phrases because as you talk to your friends and, or think about yourself about what God does and does not do, it's good to have a biblical understanding of what he does, right? Romans 5, down in verse 6. When we were yet without strength, what happened? In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Why didn't Christ die after the Garden of Eden? It wasn't the right time. There were things that had to be done first, you see. But in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Man had to be proven to be without strength. And part of that dispensationally had to do with Israel's fall. Because Israel was lifted up as a nation with a spiritual privilege, and it wasn't until a time that they proved their own failure to a degree where God says, all right, now all men can be considered failures, not belief in sinners. So at that time, he dies for the ungodly. Right. And so, in due time, you see how God's doing things according to a purpose here. Uh, moving on to 1 Timothy 2 6. We know God's will in 1 Timothy 2, verse 4, right? That all men should be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. Verse 5 For there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So Christ died at a certain time that God appointed. Remember Jesus in his ministry uh, when he, he told different people it's not yet time? Remember that? It, seemed, it sounds kind of cryptic, doesn't it? But that's because God appoints times, and there were certain times things needed to be done in Jesus' ministry. And so there's times early in his ministry where he says it's not yet time. And so he goes and hides from people. Then there's, then there's a time where like, he doesn't hide from anyone. You ever wondered that? Like in Mark chapter 1, he, people are chasing him in this town and he escapes. Like he, he can escape these crowds very easily. But then later in his ministry, he like gets caught in the garden. It's like, what happened? Well, because there was a certain time and he allowed these things to occur. You see. In 1 Timothy 2 6, 6, though, it's not just that he died at, at a certain time, at due time, but. Here, Paul says he gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So this message that Christ died for all, not just for Israel, not just for some people, not just because of Israel's sins, but for the payment and atonement of sins of all men, was a testimony, a revelation, a message, a gospel that was to be testified in due time. Nobody preached that gospel before Jesus died or before Christ revealed it to be testified, right? Right? Christ didn't tell anyone to preach, trust my cross work, you know, my death on the cross for your sins. He never told anyone to do that. He told them I was going to die, right? And then he did at the due time. And then later he said, now testify this. And he gave that first to Paul to testify. The glory of the cross, the good news of his death. Peter didn't preach good news of his death. He, he taught, you know, it was a sad event. So you see here the testif testifying of it in due time. Um, in Titus chapter 1, verse 3, you see it again, where Paul is speaking about his apostleship and the message he's preaching. Titus 1, 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, uh, which means chosen, and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So he had this purpose before the world. It wasn't plan B. 
but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me. Do you see? So when did God manifest his word or the preaching of the message of eternal life that was promised before the world began? To Paul. That's one verse three, right? So there was a right time. Not because Paul was better than someone. It was the time there. God appointed a time. And it was at that time. That's why when you study the book of Acts, people sometimes ask, well, why is it mid-Acts? Why not, you know, why is it right in the middle of a book? Well, we covered all that in our mid-Acts studies. But um, there were things that had to happen in Acts 2 and 3 and 4 and 5 and 6 and 7 and 8 before God could do what he did in Acts 9. And so there were, there were things happening in due time. Okay? All right. Moving on. Back in chapter 2, in verse, verse 3, right? Verse 3. It says, for the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. So we see the context here. This is, again, the introduction of this vision. He hasn't yet said anything yet. Um, it, is that it's about appointed times, but when are these times? Now, we just got to uncover some verses talking about appointed times that Christ revealed to Paul, a message, and things like that. But that's not what Habakkuk 2 is talking about, if you read back through the chapter. Habakkuk 2 is talking about judgment and wrath and God sitting on his throne. And it says in verse 3, when the time is that it's talking about, at the end, right? Now, you talk about the end times, do you ever stop and consider the end of what? Hmm? You're, you're, the end is near. Well, the end of what? I mean, the end of life is not good, right? I'm not, I'm not looking forward to that, if that's what you're talking about. Uh, the, the, the end of what? Morality? The end of what? The end of Israel? The end of a tribulation? So is it the end of a trouble so that now it's a time of peace? Or is it the end of peace so now it's a time of trouble? All I'm trying to do is raise the question here. When you see the phrase, the end in the Bible, you really got to ask, the end of what? People get confused. They see Paul talking about the end of the latter days. And they never ask the question, the latter days of what? You see? Because God is doing something different now than he was before. And so times change, right? Things God does changes. And different events change. You have to know at what context that you're dealing with. So that when someone talks about the end, the end of what? The flood? Right? Because there was an end to the flood. There was an end to the days before the flood. Right? There was an end to living in the Garden of Eden. There was an end of Israel's kingdom when they got destroyed and taken captive. There was an end of Jesus' ministry. Right? Jesus talks about the end of his ministry on earth, like his life on earth. So what end are you dealing with? Right? In Habakkuk 2, you can read very clearly on throughout the chapter, when it's talking about the end here, it's the end of these unrighteous rulers. Right? The Chaldeans, the unbelieving uh, Jews, they've lifted themselves up in pride, and God says, this, this is what's going to happen in the end. They're going to be knocked down. Right? So that's it's the end of their unrighteous rule, which is, of course, Habakkuk's question. Right? When are you going to intervene? And so he says, here's the vision at an appointed time of my intervention in the end of this thing. Okay, which is fascinating because if you look at, uh, oh, are we there yet? I do want to be there. Look at Luke 21, 24. The time in which Habakkuk's writing is the end of Jerusalem. You understand? Israel's a nation. Remember, they were split into two. Remember that? And the northern tribes had already been taken away. The southern tribes still existed there, but they've been living in wickedness for quite a while. So Habakkuk's asking the question, how long, Lord, before you restitute this wickedness? And he says, I'm going to destroy the whole city. Right? And at this time, Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. And then they're going to be taken captive. Israel's a nation won't exist anymore as far as politically on the scene. Right? The people are still there, but politically, the nation is no more. Okay? Other nations have conquered it entirely. And so there's going to be an end of something. And there's actually the beginning of something there going on. Okay? If I can draw a little timeline here, I'll put the cross over here just as a reference, because we're going in, back in history, right? Um, when God led Israel into their promised land, we'll put King, uh, oh, we'll put King David over here, just again for reference. You have David and Solomon the kings of, of Israel, after which Solomon reigned. Remember, they, they split Israel and Judah. There were two kingdoms, right? And then the, the ten northern tribes were taken captive, so they disappear. So now there's only the southern tribes, which is where Jerusalem was at. And the southern tribes where the temple was at, the two southern tribes. Um, and we're at this time right here where they're going to be dissolved as well. And there's this period here 
where the nation doesn't exist politically. In fact, they will not exist politically as an independent nation from here for a long while. This is why many people have, in Christianity have made a big deal of 1948 in a nation called Israel that exists independently. And even today they're fighting politically whether or not you can recognize the nation or not. Right? Because not since this time has Israel been a recognized, identified nation. Now I'm not going to deal with 1948 right now. I just, I just bring that up as a side note. But this is last time Israel was actually an independent nation. Because when Babylon, the Chaldeans, which God is raising up as his rod of punishment, comes and destroys Jerusalem... They're going to conquer it. It will not exist anymore until the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, where, remember, Cyrus allows some of them to go back? And he says to rebuild the city? They didn't rebuild the city as independent explorers. They rebuilt it under the command of a Gentile ruler. And so when they rebuilt the city, it was under Gentile rule. But at least the city was being built, right? It was a step in faithfulness uh, in Ezra and Nehemiah's day. And that city they would rebuild there would persist until Jesus' day, that when Jesus came, he came under Roman rule, remember? So he came to Israel, it was a nation, but the nation wasn't independent, it was underneath the Roman rule. What I'm trying to say here is that when Israel as a nation ended here, independently politically, not spiritually, they still had God's covenants, they still had God's promises, right? But politically, they were left the map this is when something began that the Bible calls the times of the Gentiles. You ever heard this phrase? The times of the Gentiles. That's in contrast to this time here in which God um, was not only working with Israel, which he was here as well, but where Israel actually had their land. And even during Solomon's day, they were the wealthiest nation on the planet. They were like the thing happening. And so you had Israel's glory being diminished, and then Israel's no more, and so the times of the Gentiles. And it's during this period here where you have the Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, all those empires that the secular historians like to study, they start here. They never go back and study this one. right? But this is the times of the Gentiles. And the Gentiles have been the rulers of this world ever since. Now, in Luke chapter 21... Look what Jesus says about this. Because that Jerusalem, which Ezra and Nehemiah would come back and rebuild during Jesus' day, Jesus, there was a temple there, right? There was a city. And he tells them a prophecy that this city is going to be destroyed, just like it was before it'll be destroyed. In Luke 21, 24, it says, They shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. Well, that's happened before. Remember, Jesus is writing over here. But he's talking about this city being taken away captive well, that's what Habakkuk's talking about. The city being taken away captive, which it was. And then some of them returned, a remnant returned, and Jesus says it'll be taken away captive. And then in verse uh, 24, And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. You see? So God says, Jesus says, that Jerusalem will be trodden down, right, until the times of the Gentiles is fulfilled. All right? What's the times of the Gentiles? That's the Gentile rule of the world. When the Gentile rule of the world ends, over here, <laughs> what's that mean for Israel? They have returned as a nation, independent and ruling over the nations. That's what that means, right? It doesn't mean Britain gives them a mandate, right? It, it doesn't mean they're under Gentile dominion, under USA's covenant with God. It has to do with their independent return as believers, by the way, the Bible describes this, as, as God's people, which includes Jesus Christ, Right? And being that nation city on a hill that the nations of the world come to them. That's no longer the times of the Gentiles. That's the time of God's kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, right? And so we're living, we're living in a time of these times of the Gentiles, right? This time in which Israel politically doesn't have God's endorsement until the kingdom comes. That's when Israel's kingdom will return and the times of the Gentiles will be fulfilled. Okay, that's why he says in Luke 21 and 24. I say all this back in Habakkuk 2 to talk about what the end is. He says, this is a time appointed of the end. Well, there's going to be an end of the city here. There's also going to be an end of the time of the Gentiles over here. Right? When God comes back, in order to set up that kingdom of Israel, he's going to judge the nations of the world, knock the high places low, and he's going to bring up his nation from the ashes. And he will raise them up. So the whole world will say, see what God did. Right? And by that, Jesus is going to lead them into that land. Just like Joshua in the Old Testament, which you've maybe heard from Bible teachers in the past, Joshua's the name means 
Savior, right? Which is what Jesus' name means. Joshua, Joshua and Jesus are the same name. They're just translated that way from the Hebrew and the Greek, but they're the same name. Joshua is a type of Christ. Joshua leads Israel in the promised land back here. Jesus will lead Israel in the promised land when the times of the Gentiles is over, when they end. So, meanwhile, so Habakkuk 2 is talking about this end for the city, uh, ultimately for the Gentiles and their punishment, right? So, we're going to expect to see here um, a pagan Gentile ruler over the world, which will be a type of the Antichrist, and the Messiah, who's going to come back eventually and conquer this Antichrist, right, uh, along with his people. And so, again, that's, that's just to preface what we're going to see. Uh, look at Deuteronomy 32, verse 20. I told you I probably won't get through chapter 2 today. I'm not working on it, am I? I love how much there is in just a small little book like Habakkuk. It's great. God's Word is amazing. Deuteronomy 32, verse 20. Deuteronomy 32. Remember we studied this on Sunday a few weeks ago. So how prescient that, what that lesson was. It's like Moses keeps coming up in our prophetic studies here. It's so important. Remember, God told Israel to teach this to your children, the song of Moses. So if you've forgotten the song, go back and study our Sunday lesson. But in this song, they're going to sing it at a time of darkness when they don't know why these bad things are happening to them. And in Deuteronomy 32, God tells Moses, uh, when those questions arise and you don't have any prophets because you're living in sin, I'm not sending prophets to you, um, sing this song. Because this will tell you what I'm doing to you, <laughs> what's happening, right, essentially. So it's a prophecy and a song. And Deuteronomy 32, verse 20, he says, I will hide my face from them. Uh, I, will see what their, uh, I will see what their end shall be, for they are a very froward generation, children in whom is no faith. Remember that? We talked about that on Sunday, how that he will hide his face from them so that they will have an end here because of why? They're a froward generation, right? Froward um, is different than just backward, right? For, uh, forward means I'm facing the right way, right? Froward means I'm facing against the right way. I'm against the right way. Backward is just doing this. Well, I just need to turn around, right? Froward is I'm rebellion against what is right. That's what froward means. And so it's, it's even worse than backward. And it says, they're a froward generation, children in whom is no faith. When Jesus came, he came and said that a perverse and wicked generation looks for a sign. Right? Why does he say that? Because doesn't Paul say the Jews require a sign? Yeah. And didn't Habakkuk 2, God told Habakkuk, write these visions down for a sign to the people? Make it plain so they can see it? Right? So, see, it's not that looking for the sign is wrong. It's that a, a wicked and perverse generation doesn't know what the sign is. So, they're asking, show us the sign. He's going, have you read Habakkuk? Have you read Deuteronomy? Have you read everything that I wrote to you already? This shows your wickedness because you don't even know what I told you. Right? You, you haven't heard the words of God. That's why he says they're a perverse generation. That's why they're a froward generation. Right? In Deuteronomy 32. Because God has already explained to them what they will be, right? Um, so anyway, Deuteronomy 30, 32, 20 talks about the end. This end here is a time of judgment upon this froward generation. This wicked generation. Uh, Habakkuk is talking about that. Habakkuk lives during a time of a froward generation, right? He's asking how long until you come back and give your vengeance. Jesus came at a time of a froward generation. You see the parallel here. You're going to see a lot of parallels between this time here and this time here. That's what we're going to see in chapter 2 to 3. They're going to be together. Okay. Um, meanwhile, let's move on here. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 7. Jeremiah 8, 7. Now, Jeremiah, we've spent a lot of time in the Old Testament lately. You know, we get accused of Paul, 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 Paul. I don't know how many weeks it's been in the Old Testament now. We're still in Habakkuk and everything else. Jeremiah, I think I've mentioned maybe a few times in the last month how Jeremiah and when he was writing. Uh, the questions that you ought to ask as a Bible student is who is speaking to whom are they speaking? When are they writing? Uh, Habakkuk is writing right here during this time in Israel's history. When's Jeremiah writing? The same time. Jeremiah and Habakkuk were contemporaries. 
Okay, writing about this time of darkness in Jerusalem and before their destruction. Jeremiah actually lives through the destruction. That's why he writes Lamentations. In Jeremiah 8, you see in verse 7, Yea, the stork in the heaven knoweth her appointed times, and the turtle and the crane and the swallow observe the time of their coming. But my people know not the judgment of the Lord. How do you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? Lo, certainly in vain made he it. The pit of the scribes is in vain. Do you hear God's sarcasm here? He says, how can you call yourselves wise men? Apparently, all that time the prophet spent writing things down was wasted time. You hear what he said? That's what he said. He's being sarcastic to them. Because they're going, we're wise. God, what did you tell us to do? And he's going, what? What? I just wrote a giant book, right? Man, there's a lot of preaching in that verse for today as well. <laughs> Spiritual application. People today, what is God's will? What is God doing? There's a book here. You know, I, I would be very careful of asking God, God, what are you doing today? I would first read what he wrote to you and then pray about it because it seems ridiculous not to consult God's word first. He already wrote you a Bible. But meanwhile, in verse 7, notice it says, the, the, the stork in the heaven and the turtle in the crate, they know their time of their coming, right? But my people, and his people, Israel here, are in darkness. They're living in sin. Forward generation, right? My people know not the judgment of the Lord. You see? What did Jesus say? You can discern the times and the seasons from the sky. You can tell when it's red, but you can't tell the sign of me? Like who I am and when I'm... You, you can't tell that, but you can tell the signs of the sky? Right? This, he's quoting Jeremiah 8. Jesus didn't invent that. He's just quoting Jeremiah 8. How long-suffering God is. Because Jeremiah wrote this here. Jesus quoted it again here. What's the time frame here? Quite a while. <laughs> Hundreds of years. You see, God is patiently giving mercy to the nation here. But uh, you see the time that they can't discern? They don't know this time. What's the time they don't know? The time of the judgment of the Lord. Because at this time right here, what God is going to do is bring judgment. He said it before. He said it in Deuteronomy. He said it's going to happen, and they can't tell. Right? What they're saying is, God has not intervened in a while. Apparently, he's satisfied with us, and uh, there's going to be peace. That's what Jeremiah says the false prophets say. They say there's going to be peace. No problems. Right? And, of course, they prophesy peace to the kings of Israel, which accept this prophecy of peace. And Jeremiah goes around saying, you guys are all wrong. You're all going to die. And then they put him to death, remember? They, they try to, anyway. Um, so, you get these false prophecies there. But um, the time they don't know is judgment. Now, Habakkuk is writing at this time as well, and he's writing this vision. Um, I think some of this vision is before what Jeremiah had, but he writes this vision about this coming judgment. Right? Oh, what's going to happen? All right. Matthew 24, 3. When Jesus came, his disciples asked him, when he said, it's amazing when you read Old Testament prophecy like this, because you start to see what Jesus said in his earthly ministry wasn't new at all. People love to study Matthew 24. They love to study it. And it's in the Bible, it's rightly so, but he didn't say anything new here as far as um, that it wasn't already shadowed in the Old Testament. In 24.1, Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. That wasn't the first time the city had been destroyed. It happened over here too, with Jeremiah and Habakkuk. Jesus comes and says, those buildings get thrown down because of the sin of his people, right? And what, what does the disciples say in verse 3? They said, Upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? No, they didn't ask, Tell us the sign of this coming judgment. No, they didn't ask that. They said, Sign of your coming, right? Which is something that hadn't been revealed yet, right? But tell us when these things shall be. And Jesus answers them. If you read Matthew 24, these are the so-called signs of the times, right? But remember what I told you to ask when you hear that is the, the signs of what times, right? Matthew 24 is talking about the time of Jesus' return and judgment on the earth. And so people look around and they say, well, look at this. There are um, wars and rumors of wars and things are getting bad. Those are signs of the times, Right? And then you read in verse 4, Jesus answered and said, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. 
ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. He says very clearly, the wars and rumors of wars and the bad things that are going to happen are not signs of the times. And yet Christians, in their gullibility and biblical ignorance, think that they are. Well, look at society. It's getting horrible. This has got to be a sign of the times. Chapter and verse, please, because the world has been horrible ever since before the flood. Right? This is not a new thing. You see. So Matthew 24 talks about a sign later on, and it even says clearly later on in Matthew 24 that um, the sign, don't believe it when someone says, over there is the sign, and over here is the sign, because the sign of Jesus' is coming will be seen by the entire planet as lightning from the east to the west. Right? It will be made known. But drop down to Matthew 24, down in verse 29 and 30. It says, immediately after the tribulation of those days. So what is the time Jesus has been talking about for 20-some verses? Tribulation. Tribulation. Okay? Habakkuk, in the vision here, is talking about the time of tribulation. In order to be the audience who are looking for the sign of these times, you will have to be living in the times of prophetic tribulation and judgment. Okay? Now, I want to go a little slow here because people have struggled with this. They, they think that we can be in the dispensation of grace, yet at the same time, we see prophetic signs of God's tribulation and judgment. Because that's the time Jesus is talking about. But the two are contradictory. If it's a time of tribulation, then God's not showing grace. There's going to be a time of trouble. And he's going to warn them, and the message will be, repent, because I'm going to destroy you. Right? And here, here comes the enemies. I'm raising them up right now to come destroy your city. They're knocking on your door, right? And yet, in this dispensation, God has created this body and said, you're my ambassadors. With what message? A ministry of reconciliation. The ministry is, God has died for your sins and has granted peace to all men. Right? All you have to do is trust Christ's finished work on the cross, right? And you receive peace and reconciliation and eternal life from Jesus Christ. It's a free gift. This is our message. Our message is not... God's going to judge you now if you don't come to church, right? That's not the message. But that inevitably is what people say. Our country's going down and, 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 and going towards evil and immorality because people aren't living righteously, right? But that's the covenant relationship with God under the law. Today, God has already counted everyone as sinners, which is why he says, I can only give you my grace, there's nothing you got that deserves anything. I can only give you my grace. I'm offering you grace freely right now for salvation. To say that God is bringing judgment upon the planet today is contradictory to God giving grace to sinners who don't deserve it today. You can't give grace to sinners who don't deserve it and give them what they do deserve at the same time. You can't. I'll let that percolate a little bit. right? You can't tell a sinner... I'm judging you for what you deserve. At the same time, you tell that same sinner, I'm not going to give you what you deserve. I'm giving you my grace. You can't say the two things at the same time. You'll, you'll be a liar, right? So either God's doing one or the other. And through history, he's always done one or the other, right? And Habakkuk's talking about a time of judgment. Jesus, Matthew 24, is talking about a time of judgment. And Jesus returned after this and gave to Paul a dispensation of grace and says, I postponed my judgment for the sake of salvation. Right? And so you have to make that connection, else you will fail to discern the time in which we live. We do not live in the time of the signs. And I, I'm hitting this hard because Habakkuk chapter 2 is talking about signs of a time, and specific signs of a specific time. It's not talking about the mystery dispensation, the mystery revelation of what God's doing today. Today, what God's doing today was unprecedented. You can't find any prophecy in the Old Testament. It was never prophesied that God would hold off on his judgment for 2,000 years while he offered salvation to all the worst sinners in the world freely, without any conditions, because of what Christ did on the cross for them. That was never prophesied because it was never deserved, right? The things that were prophesied was, there's sinners, I'm going to judge them. There's righteous, I'm going to reward them. That was prophesied. The question mark, however, is how can God <laughs> save the world if everyone in the world is unrighteous. Right? Who's he going to reward if everyone's unrighteous? That's the big question under prophecy that no one could answer. That was a mystery. And under the mystery of Revelation, God says, this is how I'm going to save people who are entirely unrighteous. Okay.
Meanwhile, um, we got to keep going here. Dan- Daniel chapter 8, verse 19. You know, Matthew 24, uh, part of the, the events here, Matthew 24, that, that get talked about is um, things like the false Christ and the Antichrist, the abomination of desolation in verse 14 says, The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. Gospel of the kingdom, not the gospel of the grace of God. And then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Right? Then flee to the mountains, Matthew 24 says. When you see the abomination of desolation. Now, if all you know is Matthew 24, you have no idea what this is. Because you don't know what it means to have something desolated that's an abominable thing. Okay? Um, <laughs> we have very little sacred anymore in our culture. Uh, in Old Testament law, in Israel's law, there were things that were sanctified and made holy by virtue of their placement, virtue of what they were. And so things could be desolated, ir- uh, irreverenced, and uh, profaned. But back in Daniel, which is what Matthew 24 is talking about, Daniel 8 we see talk about this abomination of desolation among the angels. There's just way too much prophecy here to cover in one night. Daniel 8, 19. Daniel receives a vision here. Now, when did Daniel live? After Jerusalem was destroyed, the Babylonians took people captive. In those people who took captive was Daniel. Right? So Daniel, the book, was written after Jerusalem has been destroyed, right? After Habakkuk's prophecies came true for that time, and Daniel's writing over here. And Daniel was a prophet of God. He was able to interpret dreams by God's revelation and able to uh, see visions of, of things from God's revelation, a very important book for pr- prophecy. And Daniel 8, he sees a vision, uh, talking about a bunch of animals and, and uh, what they do to each other and things like that. A uh, very confusing type of thing, okay? You would not know what in the world it means, except in verse 15, the angel explains it to him. Okay, It came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning, then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. That's an angel. The appearance of a man. I heard a man's voice between the banks of uh, Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. What's he saying? This vision is for the time of of the end. That's the same thing Habakkuk is talking about. Now, as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground, but he touched me and set me upright. And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. So you see the end there. The end of what? The end of the indignation. The end of the tribulation. The end of the judgment. The end of the the, the, all, the restitution. For at the time appointed, the end shall be. You see the same language struck with Habakkuk? I'm appointed, the end, the visions here. And then, so, Daniel 8, in 15 through 19, it talks about these times appointed of the end, uh, of indignation that Daniel sees. Back up to verse 13. Before he hears this, this, this interpretation, he says, I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden under, underfoot? Daniel overheard two people talking in this vision. They were talking about this transgression of desolation. Now, Daniel 10 and 12 talk more about the abomination of desolation, but I don't want to go there right now. But what I'm pointing out here is that in this time of the end that Daniel's referring to, that Jesus was referring to, that Habakkuk's referring to, Okay, they're all connected here. Do you see the connection? This time of the end, the time of the end of the tribulation, immediately after the tribulation of those days, they're all talking about the same time. And none of that is talking about today. Right? We're not in that time. Okay? In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 1, Paul says, The times and season, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. That's what he says in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 1. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7, regarding things that you see, which would be signs, he says, you walk by faith, not by sight. Right? Which will harken back to Habakkuk 2. But Habakkuk 2, in verse 3, let's get back to the text here. Habakkuk 2, verse 3. The vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. 
It will surely come. He says, wait for it. The instruction to Habakkuk and the audience of the faithful in this book is to wait for the time. Because it will happen. The time of God's judgment and his return will occur. James 5, 7 says, you have need of patience. Look at Hebrews 10, verse 36. You have need of patience so that when the Lord returns, you'll be waiting for him. That's what James 5 says. Hebrews chapter 10, written to the same audience as the book of James, the 12 tribes of Israel. Writes in verse 36, You have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. What's the will of God in Habakkuk chapter 2? Wait. Trust me. Right? I see the wickedness. I'm going to bring judgment. And you may say that's unrighteous judgment. I see their sins too. I'm going to set things right. I'm going to restitute everybody. Right? I'm the holy, perfect, righteous God. He says, have patience that after you've done the will of God by waiting, you might receive the promise for yet a little while. And he that shall come will come, verse 37, and will not tarry. Hebrews 10, 37 is a quote of Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3. Because you need a patience. And he quotes Habakkuk. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Only this verse here, it says, he that shall come. Over in Habakkuk, it says, verse 3, though it tarry, wait for it. Right? <laughs> So it's a little change there by the Holy Spirit. Because by Hebrews, now we know a who. <laughs> Jesus Christ is the judge, the Messiah, right? Habakkuk, they didn't know Jesus Christ. They just knew the Lord Jehovah. And he says the it is the judgment, the time of judgment. It will come. Hebrews 10 says to people who are cast out of the city by an unbelieving forward generation. Over here. Wait for him. He will come. Have patience. He will come, and judgment will come, restitution will come. These were the believers of Jesus in Hebrews, right? Why are they kicked out of the city? Why are they persecuted? Why aren't the unbelievers persecuted? That's the question. They can have the same question Habakkuk does, right? God, how long is it before you return? Because you told us to wait here while you go to heaven, and we're here getting killed, right? And look at, look at these people in the temple. I mean, they claim to be your people, but they don't even believe you as the Messiah. We believe you as the Messiah. Why aren't we in the temple, Right? That's their question in Hebrews. In Hebrews, the author of Hebrews quotes Habakkuk and says, remember Habakkuk? Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember Habakkuk. The same thing's going on now, <laughs> right? He says, you have need of patience. For you have a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. You need to wait for it. You need to wait for salvation, right? Wait for deliverance, wait for judgment, wait for the promise. Peter says in Acts 3, repent for the times of restitution. <laughs> They're at hand. He can send Jesus that come and bring the kingdom, right? That's what Acts 3 says. Keep your hand in Hebrews chapter 10 and turn to Isaiah 30. Have I not even got through the first section of my outline yet? That's no. <sighs> Isaiah 30. I, I, this is kind of fun connecting these dots, though. Isaiah 30, verse 15. He tells a, uh, gives a prophecy here to Isaiah about rebellious Israel. He says, write in a book that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. He says that your iniquity, in verse 13, shall be to you as a breach ready to fall. Verse 14, you shall break it as the breaking of the potter's vessel. Verse 15, for thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel. Didn't we cover on Sunday who that was? It's Jesus Christ. The only one of Israel, in returning and rest shall ye be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. What's he saying in Isaiah 30, verse 15? Returning and rest. Don't run away from God. Return to him, right? And rest in him. And it says what? That'll be your salvation, right? And you shall be saved. In quietness and confidence. What's the opposite of quietness? Well, you're doubting, you're raising questions, you're murmuring, you're complaining, which is often things Israel and we do. In quietness and in confidence. Confidence in who? In God, right? Trusting Jehovah. This theme is, is persistent throughout the Old Testament. Be quiet and confident in the Lord, not in yourself. Return to the Lord and rest in the Lord and you shall be saved. This is the theme throughout the Old Testament. 
Now, you don't find anywhere in this verse, Jesus Christ dying for your sins and rising from the dead for your justification. What you find here, trusting the Lord, having confidence in him. And Hebrews is all about Isaiah 30, verse 15. It's about the Holy One of Israel. Hebrews 4, the whole chapter is about the rest of God, resting in God. Hebrews chapter 4. It talks about quietness and confidence. In Hebrews 11, the whole chapter is about faith in God. By faith, they did things, even when they didn't see it. By faith, they did it, having confidence in God. It's a hall of faith, right? Isaiah 30, 15 says, that's your salvation. You're resting in God. You're uh, returning to God. Your quietness and confidence in God, that should be your strength. And he says in, in the verse, and ye would not. You see, you didn't want to do that. You would not. But you said, no, for we will flee upon horses when the enemy comes. We'll flee upon horses. Uh, we'll flee when the, 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 the bad circumstances come. And we will ride upon the swift. Therefore, God says, they, shall they that pursue you be swift. Because you didn't have confidence in me, you didn't wait on me, you're going to be part of the destruction. That's what Isaiah 30 verse 16 says, right? One thousand shall flee at the rebuke of one, the rebuke of five shall ye flee till you be left as a beacon upon the top of a mountain. You're not going to be some bright light like a sun in the world, you're going to be a small little light on the top of a mountain. As an ensign on a hill. And therefore will the Lord wait. And he goes on in verse 18 saying, I am, I'm going to wait on you. You won't wait on me, I'll wait on you. And that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore will he be exalted, that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait for him. Hebrews is about God's people, the little flock of Israel, waiting on Jesus Christ, having confidence in him. Peter says, don't put away your confidence, right? They need to endure to the end, Mark 13, 13, right? Which is, brings us to Habakkuk 2, verse 4 which we'll just start and we'll finish next week. Okay, but Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, which is the most popular verse in this chapter. After all this introduction about the sign of the times and uh, things are going to occur at, in the appointed times of God, and here's going to be the sign of these things occurring, and I'll tell you what that is. And then he says, but you need to wait for it because it will surely come. It will not tarry because God's appointed it to come. Be and he says in verse 4, behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. And so then we have these two characters here. Uh, one, who, the person whose soul is lifted up, and one who is the just, right? The one whose soul is lifted up is not just, because it says is not upright. You see that? The soul, his soul is lifted up is not upright. Why is his soul lifted up? Because he looks at the circumstances and says, I don't see judgment coming, Right? And he looks at himself and says, I'm sitting in a high place. Jeremiah, you're a dirty prophet in the pit. I'm the king of Israel, right? I'm the king of Babylonian Empire. We're ruling the world, right? You guys are in Swayze. We've got 5,000 people in our megachurch, right? People always have confidence. Their soul gets lifted up when they look at the circumstances and they happen to be good, Right? It says in this verse, all throughout the Bible, it says the just shall live by faith. How do you get faith? By hearing the word of God. Right? Faith comes by hearing the word of God. It's not by looking at the circumstances. The circumstances can be entirely contrary to what you think good is. But if you trust God, what he says being true, right? First of all, you won't be disappointed. The Bible says you will not be ashamed. You will not be disappointed in the end because it will occur. As he said, that's hope, right? But secondly, um, you won't be trusting the circumstances. You'll be trusting... This book, right? Habakkuk 2, verse 4, then. Habakkuk, who's living at this time of hopelessness and darkness in Israel, and God says, I'm going to bring judgment, don't worry. And he doesn't see judgment come. He wants judgment to come so that the sinners you know, go away and the righteous stand. But he doesn't see it coming at all, right? He doesn't know where salvation's at. And he says, you need to trust me, and you need to live by your faith, right? That's the instruction. So, remember back in Habakkuk 1, verse 11, you had the, the king of Babylon there whose soul is lifted up. And even, even Habakkuk, when he says, God, how can you take the wicked to devour the one who's more righteous than he? Remember that? Well, who's the one more righteous than the Babylonians? You could, you could either say the nation of Israel spiritually or Habakkuk himself, who's part of the faithful remnant, right? I mean, he's not like these wicked rulers in Israel. He's, he's a prophet. He's, he's living by faith. Or he's considering himself righteous, rather. And uh, God says, you're only righteous because of faith. The just live by his faith. You're not righteous in yourself. 
So if your soul is lifted up by who you are, Habakkuk, because you talk to me, because you're a prophet, because you're a child of Israel, um, that's not upright at all. Right? Isn't that what God's teaching? This is why when Paul teaches in Romans 3, he says that, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Right? Why? Because God's teaching Habakkuk. You're going to live by faith, Habakkuk. Not because you're Israel. Not because you had some covenant that you break. Not because you're under God's law, which you break. Right? If, if you're going to be just, you're going to live by faith. Trusting in me. Right? Witnessed by the law and the prophets. But you see, Habakkuk knew nothing about Jesus Christ. Nothing about the grace through the cross. But he knew about faith in God. You see? And this is, if I can just take a step away from the context, this is why it's so important to understand the Bible rightly divided, because uh, people who will teach faith in God in Habakkuk 2, and rightly so, it's the right thing to teach from Habakkuk 2, they'll never teach or won't communicate the thing you need to have faith in today, which is Christ's finished work. Right? Jesus Christ, and in the body of Christ, and that mystery of revelation, the fellowship of the mystery, they don't understand that either. So they're just like Habakkuk, blind to the mystery, right? which is so much more excellent. Paul says in Philippians 1, it's more excellent. It's the manifold wisdom of God. So they're missing out on riches that Christ has for them. You see, this is the problem. And so you have Christians who don't know what they have in Christ, don't know who they are in Christ, don't know if they're in Christ. Because they don't know the faith Christ has revealed through the mystery. To Habakkuk, however, he knew the covenant in Israel, and he's, and he's, be, he's being taught, he's learning here, that he, he is going to be just if he trusts in God. And it's God's going to have, provide the strength and he, the confidence is going to be strengthened by him, not by the circumstances or by himself. That's where he's going to get the hope in chapter 3. Is that God is faithful. God is strong. God will do what he says. He appoints times. He's going to, make the time, he's going to meet the date. He's going to do it. Right? So I just need to trust him. Right? Which is good. Right? But you also need to know what he's going to do. God tells Habakkuk what he's going to do. He says, I'm going to come in judgment. Okay? Just like Jesus told his disciples, when you see this abomination of desolation, go to the mountains. He tells them what to do. Just because they trust God and don't know when it's going to happen doesn't mean they don't know what to do. Okay? The idea of being ignorant about what God's doing is nowhere found in the scripture. God will tell you what he's doing, and you need to do that. All right? So, we'll stop there in Habakkuk 2, verse 4. We'll pick it up next week as we talk about the... Um, the three places in the New Testament that quote this verse, and then we'll uh, pick up the five woes, which is the actual uh, uh, condemnation that God gives to the wicked uh, who are overruling uh, the city over here, Habakkuk, okay? We'll cover the, there's five woes there, and it's fascinating, these woes, um, there's another place in the Bible, not just one, that speaks about woes upon the earth in Revelation, and these woes line up with Revelation and what God brings in judgment upon the earth in Revelation as well. So uh, while you find Habakkuk in sh prophecy and shadow, Revelation really opens up and tells you what exactly is happening. So it's, it's an amazing connection. We'll cover more of that next week. Any questions, any comments about the first four verses? Lord, we thank you for giving us all scripture for our learning, that we might have hope and strengthen faith in you. We thank you most of all, Lord, for finishing the scripture, completing uh, your wisdom revealed so that we can understand not only your faithfulness and the hope we can have in you, but how you accomplish salvation for us sinners. We thank you for the revelation of your grace and the revelation of salvation that we can learn about in later epistles in your scripture, that we can know who you've made us and the promises you've given us by your grace so that we can live apart from the circumstances today and rejoice in hope of the glory that we have been promised through your son, Jesus Christ. God, we thank you for all of these things, the people here that join together in the inheritance and in our, in our salvation and the glory that we'll share with you uh, one day in heaven. Lord, we thank you for all spiritual blessings. Amen.